Welcome to Embedded. I'm Elysia White, alongside Christopher White. Today we'll be discussing why I hate the term Internet of Things. <laughs> Wait, no, um, we'll be discussing the management of distributed systems with Memfault's Tyler Hoffman. Hey, Tyler. Welcome. Hello. Could you tell us about yourself? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I'm Tyler Hoffman. I am generally an embedded firmware engineer. Over the last three years, I've been doing, um, apparently like Chris, mostly Python and building Memfault's backend services data infrastructure to um, manage our, our device management platform and, and diagnostics tools. Before then, I was a firmware engineer at Pebble and Fitbit, where I constantly found myself doing more developer tools and infrastructure um, than writing firmware. All right. Uh, we will have questions about, well, writing firmware uh, and managing it and all of that. But first, we're going to do narrow lightning topic, round. Narrow topic. <laughs> lightning round, where we ask you short questions and we want short answers. Are you ready? I am. Okay, easy one. Favorite fictional robot? Wally. IoT, edge devices, or distributed systems? Ooh, IoT, edge devices. Who had a better smartwatch, Fitbit, Pebble, or Apple? Pebble. It's an easy one. <laughs> Preferred code editing tool? Now, PyCharm. It's great. CMake, Make, or something else? CMake, but I don't know it super well. Open source software, yes or no? Yes. Uh, complete one project or start a dozen? Per finish two, 80% of the way. <laughs> if you were teaching a course about embedded systems, what three topics should you definitely cover? Oof. Um, unit testing, debugging, and build systems. Okay, I have a late-breaking question for you. Have you ever ridden the Boilermaker Express? I never did, actually. I hopped aboard it when it was stationary, but never while it was moving. Uh, Follow-up, where did the name Boilermaker come from? I mean, I'm going to guess here. Uh, I mean, I do know it was from the men who worked on trains and railroads. I'm, I'm asking real-time questions that are coming into me from a fellow uh, Purdue alum. So that's, if anybody's <laughs> wondering what the heck is going on, that's what those questions are for. I went to Purdue for undergrad, for the listeners. Uh, okay, we're going to go back to the course thing, because that was kind of important. That I'm was, sorry. Do you I forgot remember? That, I forgot <laughs> that you're trying to get everybody to do your homework for you. That wasn't it. Okay, so listeners, sorry, Tyler's just going to take a second. Listeners, I am teaching a course for a company called Classpert. That's like class and expert. Mm. Had a little word together and called it Classpert. I like it. Uh, and it's about embedded systems. It goes through my book. Uh, it has a whole bunch of extra stuff. I am doing videos. I'm doing all kinds of lectures. There'll be mentors and, and real-time discussions. And projects. And projects. Um, and I'll put a link in the show notes. But I hope you check it out. Uh, the first class is going to be kind of small because, let's face it, I haven't done this before. Uh, but the class part folks seem to really have their act together. And let's face it, my logo for them is awesome. Okay, sorry, Tyler. Back to you. Uh, debugging, unit testing, and what was the other one? Build systems. Well, all right. Uh, I think that's that's where we're going to head for the whole show. Uh, recently on Twitter, I asked about IoT management for non-cell phone devices like BLE or Zigbee with a backhaul cell phone or coordinator, non-Linux Ethernet devices. And I wanted to know what p platforms people use and what they like and what you'd suggest for a new small company entering the IoT space. Do you have an answer to that? I think we all have somewhat strong opinions to that. Um, I didn't get any response. I mean, on Twitter, I was so surprised. <laughs> but yes, we I have strong opinions, mostly in the, oh, God, get me out of here opinion. But you yes. you actually are in that space. 
were in that space. And, and my guess as to why people did not respond to you would be because no one has a very strong or confident or, or probably even right answer to that question. Because I feel like a lot of them are, mm, you know, mediocre at best, a lot of these systems. Um, in terms of what platforms we've seen people use. So yeah, so we work with a lot of customers at Memphal. We talk to a lot of engineers. I have never talked to more embedded systems engineers in my entire life than I have, you know, over the last two or three years. Zephyr, Minute, FreeRTOS, and the Espressif IDF are the ones that come up most commonly in the customers that we talk to. But those are the devices. I was looking for what happens after you get to 10 units in your lab. Yes. Um, and that is a fantastic question. You know, there's really not much. Of course, there are all these big cloud providers that provide some sort of IoT system, and they believe that your small embedded devices are, you know, computers sitting in your sitting in your um, offices or in your closet somewhere and not necessarily a very small embedded device. And I know that's what you're what you're looking for. Yes, non-Linux Ethernet devices. Exactly, right? And so AWS has one, right? Like the you can use free RTOS with AWS IoT and Microsoft bought um, ThreadX, the RTOS there. And Espressive has their own cloud backend that they want to use as well, or they want people to use. I wouldn't say all of them are good, and they weren't written to be usable, especially by engineers or people who don't know exactly how to use these systems to begin with. Why is this such a hard problem? Is it because you're taking a step beyond just firmware to now having an understanding of networking and software as as a service kinds of things you have to make that that kind of a jump in expertise or is it that nobody has made a real kind of turnkey okay this is easy we will do everything for you kind of solution i mean the ones writing the firmware are very much not the people writing the backhaul services and i don't know if they talk to each other often enough and that's you know, I'm sure both of you working at previous companies doing embedded systems, that's probably true, is the firmware engineers very rarely talk to the cloud engineers, I believe. Um, I know that was true for the for the last two companies that I worked for. I think it's worse at some of the big companies. Um, Azure and Amazon both have IoT offerings that really do seem to be written for software engineers working on computers, not written for firmware engineers trying to squeak out one last bite of RAM. <laughs> exactly, right? And and especially trying to like do SSL connections and yes, HTTPS yes. over with like, you know, 64K or some of our customers like 32K of RAM. Like it's just not happening. Yeah, I think I think you're right that that's a huge piece of it is some of the things you must conform to don't really fit. <laughs> yeah. And they were never intended to fit. And the other thing that's also tough with a lot of those platforms that exist today is they assume that these devices have infinite power, pretty much infinite <laughs> resources, and and they have a constant and stable internet connection to these systems. And that's very rarely the case unless you are literally a computer in a closet, you know, running running Linux. I've worked on two big distributed systems such that I've had to get involved with both the software and the hardware. And one was ShotSpotter, where we had dozens and dozens of sensors in each covered city, and we had dozens and dozens of covered cities. And every day we wanted to know, well, was there a sensor that didn't have its heartbeat, that didn't check in, which meant its radio or power was down? Uh, Was there a sensor that had a fault um, or didn't hear anything and therefore probably was had something wrong. And I mean, once you get up to like a thousand sensors, it becomes hard. And we did it, we did it with visual basic querying SQL tables <laughs> in Excel and color coding. My, my in big Excel too. In I mean, Excel. To, 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 in your, in your defense, AWS didn't exist. None of this stuff existed back then. That's, that's true. I mean, it was, it was 2007, eight, nine ish. 
that's kind of still what they want you to do though. They're, they're going to put all your data. They're just going to export your data to a CSV file in S3. And they're going to tell you to like <laughs> do it yourself. Like that's all they're going to provide. But one of the other problems with that, I mean, the communication was part of it, but for some of the devices, we were on a self modem. And so every byte you sent back actually cost money. Mm-hmm. And so we didn't want to do a heartbeat every minute because that that actually adds up to a lot of money every day. But no back, no, I don't, what is this called? Is device management, IoT management takes into, into account the need for small data updates. Updates. And, yeah. And so, yeah, so, so, so can I, can I pitch Memfault really quickly or just yes, like yes, say please. what we're attacking, right? It's like, we are, so yes, what, what we, what we did at Pebble and Fitbit, you know, Pebble, we built our own. It was very simple. Our devices connected through a phone and every so often reported back through that phone to a, to a very scalable Python application written on Heroku. Honestly, that's how we got most of our data back at Fitbit massive systems um i'm sure both of you have some history on that and how those are built but but yeah very complex systems but completely homegrown and why we we wanted to build memfault was because we we kept seeing this problem over and over again we're like no matter what company we went to we were going to have to build this system or you know shoehorn one of these larger systems into a into a hardware product embedded system again and me, Chris, and Francois were just like, we can't do that again. Like, we we don't want to solve this problem for the third or the fourth time. And so that's Memfault. And that is, it's like, we're getting in, I would say, more so device management. I think everyone defines it differently, which I guess is also part of this conversation. Um, I see it as kind of three or three or more things. It's like provisioning. It's giving the device, you know, some sort of certificates or device serial that you, you know, put it, put it on in the, the factory assembly line. It is knowing whether that device is alive and how well it's doing. And then it's also pushing new updates to those devices. I think those are the three things for, for device management. Memfault does very well, in my opinion, the OTA delivery and the monitoring and diagnostics. We do not have yet maybe um, any sort of provisioning services, you know, security keys. We're not, we're not doing those things yet which I think is the one thing that AWS IoT like maybe does well, but also very confusing. How do you do over the updates if you don't have security keys programmed in manufacturing? For our customers, we assume they are going to do that themselves. Fair so enough. we are basically saying, bring your own system. We don't, you know, I think other companies are attacking it in the way that like, you need to use our platform. You need to use our chips that we provide you you know they're like ten dollars a piece and please use our chips please use our back end and you can build your product on top of it you know um we're just saying not very scalable i mean which is not very scalable um but like i think a lot of these companies are are building it for very large and expensive devices right like if you're building a tractor or if you're building sure. a, a, a big machine on an assembly line, like you don't care about the cost at that time. But if you're building a wearable device that costs a hundred bucks, you need something that works for that company and, and, you know, for that business model. And there's not much there. One of the problems with supporting provisioning and manufacturing that I've seen some vendors try to help with ends up with them having the keys. And mm-hmm. that's always been a non-starter for me. Vendor lock-in. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, in the end, if I'm protecting the customer data or protecting my device through secure over-the-air downloads, I don't really want anyone else to have that information. Correct. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, there's there's no good solution, but I will... Yeah, the the comment, like, have you heard of providers that don't give you the private keys if you give them on a device, like the provisioning? I think so, because sometimes there are, I don't want to call out anybody, but there are some companies that provide a whole solution from network to dashboard. And you write a little bit of code for their 
widget and you don't really get to know anything else about it. Got it. And so you're basically writing software for this thing that exists in in the environment that you're placing it in. Yeah. And sometimes, I mean, like over the air updates happen kind of magically, which mm -hmm. is terrifying um, because you don't really want over the air updates to happen like you want continuous integration with software. Correct. And especially when it comes to hardware, because the inevitable and the worst case is you're going to brick units or have issues in the field that you can't possibly handle or, or want to deal with, basically. Yeah, it really feels like the companies that do what, what you're describing, at least, is they see, like we said, they have that software perspective. It's like, well, how can we make the device a software thing? <laughs> how can we make the device just part of the cloud? And, you know, if you write software for it, it's, you know, we own, we own everything that's involved with it, basically. So it's a, it's a difficult balance. And when you say provisioning, you mean the security piece, not the provisioning that the customer has to do when they get it home and have to connect it. Correct. Yes. I mean, I mean, the certificates you know, and stuff flashing, flashing the, yeah. Flashing the device with like, this is your device serial. This is your Mac address. This is your Bluetooth ID. And this is your security token that like is how you will communicate to anything, but not necessarily like customer onboarding and let's install your first OTA payload and everything. Is there a different word for what the customers do? Mm, honestly, I would call it onboarding, honestly. Okay. I think it's what I've always used. Yeah. So, so going back very briefly to the to the the larger systems, what they try to do and what they're what they're focusing on is like secure transport. In in my opinion, a lot of it for for OTA, you know, updates specifically is as long as you have secure boot, you're fine. Like as long as the payload is signed and you install it, which I think most of the bootloaders today and in the embedded system platforms that you can you can use, like you're generally going to be fine. What do I need to know as a firmware engineer about OTA when I'm thinking about these large distributed systems? Um, signing and hashing are important, where hashing is the checksum, but with security and signing says it really did come from the person I said it came from. Yeah. It's funny. Um, it's it funny. It has to be a hundred percent. Sorry, it, it was. It, I'm only saying funny because uh, at Pebble we actually didn't have secure boot. We didn't have signed payloads. It was more of a. It was more of a hacker device, and so like we just assumed the device connected to the mobile app, and and it, everything was fine. But but I, I'm thinking back now. It's funny because there was a group of people they were called pebble bits pebble bits and they would modify the pebble firmware in whatever way they wanted where they added new fonts they they built they built internationalization for and they, but they basically just like modified our firmware in very different ways adding like really cool features um but then you would just click the link in the mobile app and it would just like automatically push that firmware to the pebble which i thought was fantastic but like you could install whatever you wanted on that Pebble device <laughs> as long as the CRC matched. Which, which is great when you have a hacker device and it's mm -hmm. great yes. when you have it on your desk as a developer, but it is not great when like the president of the United States is wearing your smartwatch. At that point, totally. you want a little more <laughs> security. <laughs> what are you saying? <laughs> And let's just hope that every hardware, every hardware company is, is making sure that, you know, they are using those secure practices. All we can do is write on interrupt about that. You should do it. Interrupt is your blog, right? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Memfault's founders, the, the three of us kind of just were like, we need to write some content because it doesn't exist. So let's do it ourselves. And it's a good blog and I have pointed to it and been pointed to it various times and yet I was totally unaware of the connection to Memfault or what Memfault did. Have you considered maybe just a little more promotion? <laughs> there is this, I mean, yeah. So, so our, our marketing employee, Colleen would love that. Um, there is this, there is this fine line that we are trying to balance between aggressive self-promotion and also trying to build this community on the side of the company that we don't ultimately control. 
Um, I've seen it time and time again. And the reason I don't like a lot of the embedded systems communities is the ones that you find are like almost always owned by a company or enterprise and like the largest and arguably, you know, best LinkedIn group that I found for embedded systems is like blatantly owned by a consultant, like an embedded systems consultancy. And it's just awful. And they've actually ruined it now. And so we wanted to just not do that. Um, but yes, we should do a little bit more self-promotion. And now that we, you know, have a, a very good product that we all believe in and we do think almost any hardware company that's building on embedded systems and now Android and soon embedded analytics, like all of them would benefit from it. And so now we're not super opposed to it. We're actually just had a meeting last week about how we're going to um, get some more people to understand what Memfault is who are reading interrupt. Marketing is really hard. I mean, because there is that balance between I did this thing. I think you'll think it's cool that most engineers are, are, are like, hesitant about and then there's this you know what i need i need this thing and not realizing that somebody else has already built it and done a good job of it mm -hmm. i don't know how to do that i mean i have that problem with the podcast that i i, I think i should be marketing more i think there should be more out there because I, I do think it's a good thing and i think people like it but i i don't really want to market it's no <laughs> fun and it's it feels wrong yeah, it always feels like you're advertising to people that don't want to listen. And I mean, what we've learned a lot is like people actually want to hear about Memfault and and read more content. Um, and yeah, to, to tie it back. So, so what we want Interrupt to become ultimately is a community of developers that they feel like, you know, it's at least helped by Memfault. We, we may provide resources to the community. Eventually, it could come come into like you know, a more f fleshed out website that's more of a, a hub that you kind of hop into and learn more about embedded systems, maybe a conference in the future. But we don't want to be the company that owns it. If somebody else wants to come in and help us out, great. And, and we will provide resources to it. But that's kind of it. And yeah, like embedded.fm should become a community that, that, you know, if you two want to stop doing it, it should live on, right? Yeah. Although Hopefully. if somebody offers us enough money for the Slack, we will totally sell. <laughs> but it's going to have to be a lot. Yeah. Yeah, five, ten dollars <laughs> Maybe, maybe 20 I mean, at least buy you a couple of meals in San Francisco, right? Well, that's going to be more like 100 then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, I want to go back to over-the-air programming. Sorry. Mm -hmm. All the way back to there. Um, wait, security and hash hashes for when you you get the the firmware mm -hmm. or signatures and hashes what else as a firmware engineer do i need to be thinking about with over the air updates y you mentioned a secure bootloader is that something the vendors are providing now or is that still something i have to write unless you have specific needs or requirements generally you're not writing it um I think most vendors are providing it. They're not great. And so a lot of companies are just using, you know, if you're using a standard enough chip, a, a bootloader is probably built for you, whether that's Wolf Boot or, or MCU Boot or... Um, Nordics DFU. Nordics DFU. And I'm sure Zephyr, you know, they don't necessarily have a bootloader, but they basically will like tell you how to go about doing this. Well, and TI has OAD. Why are there different initials for everybody? This seems like a term we should agree on now. At least DFU. I mean, I think most people who I talk to will now use the phrase DFU. But that's also like the only way that they know how to install firmware too. So, Doing uh, the firmware update over the air programming device firmware update over the air downloads, whatever it's called. <laughs> um for a few units in your lab is different than deploying to a few million smartwatches. We <laughs> don't have to go that far even, but yes. Well, no, you don't have to go that far. <laughs> I mean, that's drastic. Yeah. But, but we've done it. What are the, what are the steps? What are the gotchas? And what do I need to know as a firmware engineer taking the steps to get from 
a few devices to consumer production level? Yes. Um, even so, yes, I will answer that in just a moment. Even before we get there, the, you asked, what is a requirement? You have to just have an OTA system that works and has a fail safe. And so like, if you ship a bad firmware, the device should be able to restore an old firmware or restore a very, very minimal firmware that knows how to contact, you know, or knows how to phone home or, or send out a signal that, you know, some phone passing by will eventually install a firmware on it. At, at Pebble, we chose the minimal firmware route. If you booted a firmware and it failed three times in a row within, I think the span of 15 minutes, we would boot up into what we called the factory firmware, which we had tested and hardened for a very long time that you could install a firmware over Bluetooth and you could factory reset the watch to absolute factory conditions. And so in my opinion, like that is step one. Um, and that you should build that when you have five devices, or at least you're starting to build sealed units. Cause if you can JTAG anything, like you're probably not going to care about a re reliable OTA delivery system at that point, getting to millions of devices, that's a whole different ball game. I think the buzzwords and actually true words are you need staged rollouts. This is, um, deploying to 10 devices, then a hundred devices, and then a thousand, 10,000, and you scale linearly, basically. Um, and that entire time you are getting data back from the devices. How are you doing? How's the new firmware behaving? Um, and are there any new crashes or anything that I should be aware of? Um, that's a whole different system. We'll talk about that later, but like stage rollouts and making sure that you get some form of ping or heartbeat or status after you've installed a firmware update is probably the most critical thing when you're dealing with the millions of devices. Cause if you update even thousand, um, and you just don't hear anything from a device anymore, like that's when the sirens go off and <laughs> you press the big red button on the side of your desk, right? It's when you go to Reddit that, and see what everybody's that, complaining about. <laughs> exactly. You start reading Amazon, you check Reddit, you check Twitter. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's so true. You you like hit the nail on the head there. Uh, that's exactly how we felt at Pebble. Um, as soon as a Reddit thread came up, hey, is version 2.4 broken for anyone else? We're like, stop everything. <laughs> it's weird to get that sort of feedback from customers. I mean, that's this exact sort of feedback you desperately don't want. And yet... If, if there's an error that only happens on one out of a hundred units, you're not going to find it in the first couple stages of rollout unless you get lucky. Or, or unless that person is a very vocal Reddit user for sure. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, oh, it, it's, it's so, it's so relevant to me as well. Like I just remembered, um, one of my first tasks at Pebble, and it was so irresponsible at the time, but I came in, you know, I'm, I'm just out of college. And in my first month, I, you know, did a couple, couple tickets, fixed a couple bugs. And then they were like, all right, Tyler, like no one wants to be the release lead for, you know, this version 2.4. <laughs> and they were like, you are going to be the one to release this firmware. And it takes about a month, you know, month and a half. You're basically working on it full time. You are triaging every bug that comes in. You are fixing all the bugs that are easy. And then you're kind of like making sure that all the other ones that are harder or like, you know, more specific to engineers, you're making sure that those all get fixed. You're deploying nightly firmware updates. And ultimately what it means is you're, you're dealing with the one or two people that just break their watches in like every which way. Um, and yeah, that was, <laughs> that was my first, like that was my second month at Pebble and it was super fun. Thankfully at that point we had logs, we had core dumps, and we had some very minimal metrics coming back from devices. So we had, you know, battery life and a few heartbeats here and there. So we generally knew how things were going when we were releasing, even internally. Um, but yeah, like you have to watch Reddit, honestly, like as soon as something comes up there, it's like, <laughs> let's pause for a second. But this release engineer position uh, or, or, or role Mm -hmm. does tend to get passed around because it's not very fun. 
especially if you're the person who has to make all the versions be right, verify, do the test verifications, make mm-hmm. sure the security keys are in the right place, do some documentation for manufacturing, all of these little things. And then you, you have to compile the image with the security keys, make sure that you can update the firmware, downgrade the firmware, update, upgrade the firmware, this whole dance to make sure that it's releasable. It is a pain, but it's also one of the most important things we have to do. And it's one of the most, it's the least often thing we do for a lot of us. And so it's full of mistakes. Yes. I mean, how many times have you had to write the checklist? I've had to modify the checklist and update it plenty of times. I think during my my tenure at Pebble, I think I was the release lead like four or five times. And like every single release, something changed or it was out of date. And, you know, I skipped a few steps here and there and I only messed up once. I think we deployed um, a, not a bad firmware, but a, like an incorrectly labeled firmware to to like a hundred to a thousand people, you know, it, it got the Git SHA. It got like, you know, 2.8 dash ABCDEFG instead of 2.8. <laughs> um, but that was my, that was my one mistake it's there. It's not so bad. It's not so bad. No, it wasn't bad at all, but it was, it was also just something that like somebody will post on Reddit and just be like, Hey, what's going on here? Like, this is not <laughs> normal. <laughs> um, and it just doesn't look great. Working at LeapFrog on consumer devices, uh, we didn't have the problem of over-the-air update, but we did have the problem of releasing and manufacturing with very strict. I mean, they were going to start. They make masked ROMs, and so you can't you can't change them afterwards, and so you have to make sure you you get the firmware right. Mm-hmm. And the number of times someone had to change a version number so that it matched some document, and did it with a hex editor. Oh, gosh. Because if you recompiled, you had to go through testing again. But if you just made it match the documentation, <laughs> it was all fine. Um, yeah. Well, sorry. Distraction. Uh, yeah. And when you rebuild a firmware and you try to ship it to people, you have to go through, like, depending on how complicated or how sophisticated the company is, like, you're either going to say, all right, well, now it needs seven days of soak time or 14 days of soak time. Um but if you, what we did at Pebble instead was like, you track it for a day. And if the battery life is trending in the right direction, we're like, instead of, you know, letting every single watch run out of batteries for 14 days and then measuring the duration of that each watch took to die um, or needed a recharge, we just like said, okay, cool. Every single device that is out there today running our firmware dropped 7% today. Okay, great we're ready to ship the firmware tomorrow. The battery life trends look good (laughs) rather than waiting 14 days, which I know many, many other teams basically have a, you know, a requirement to do that. But if you have to wait that long, then if there's a really important bug, you have time and you have more people on Reddit complaining about you. You're preaching to the choir. Yep. (laughs) There's this balance of, of do I let it go? And with wearables, with, with Pebble, with Fitbit, um, that whole, you did something to make the battery life die? If you're running on your desk with a unit that has a power supply instead of a battery, you're never going to know that. Or you're just not connected to the right Android phone from oh a particular gosh, yes. vendor <laughs> with a particular Bluetooth right? stack in a particular weekday of the week. Yes. And and then people complain that their batteries die. It's... Yes. The number one complaint. Well, number two complaint. Number one complaints probably might it doesn't connect or it drops constantly. Number number two is battery life drops or you know is terrible. Yeah. Okay. You mentioned monitoring the battery life, and you've mentioned, Mm -hmm. and we've both mentioned heartbeats. Once I get my firmware out there, what else do I need to know? And this is where Memfall comes in. Like this is our bread and butter. It's like once you get the firmware out, what are you? tracking and what are you making sure looks good and so number one make sure your devices are alive and reporting anything number two um uh make sure your devices aren't rebooting um i think the the simplest thing you can track for for firmware is 
count the number of times or at least send an event or, or find some way to report whether your devices are crashing or resetting or hitting an assert. And then ideally reporting some, some, you know, piece of information about how it's asserting or crashing. And that's usually, you know, the program counter or, or the link register, or if you can, you know, you've a more complex firmware, you can usually pull the function or a, a backtrace basically. And so, at least get those two things. So you can kind of tell whether this firmware is more crashy or not than the other ones. Beyond that, now you're kind of searching for trends like battery life, you know? Um, and and you said heartbeat. That's actually the phrase that I use for, and, and Memfault uses for events that happen periodically. Um, we can talk about this as well. It's like, how, how often do you send these periodic heartbeats, um, at Pebble? We did it every hour. And so for every single hour, we would track how much did the battery life drop? How many ticks or seconds was the CPU active? How many seconds was the Bluetooth chip on? Um, how many disconnects were there on Bluetooth? how how much time were was i connected on bluetooth for this hour and and before we shipped any firmware at pebble you had to at least meet or exceed you know those certain trends so your battery life had to drop less than the previous one or be within acceptable limits um and and if your bluetooth connection time per hour dropped significantly like that as a regression in firmware and we made a bug or or you know there's contention on the cpu or, or you know the connection interval change that you made just like chris mentioned with android phones like the connection interval changed and it made a lot of android phones upset um can't tell you how many times we had to change that as well um yeah i mean i think i can go on and on about this too it's something that I've seen IoT companies not consider. Um, on one hand, all that information is very useful. On the other hand, if you are a battery-powered device, the more often you send that information, the less often you will manage to live through the whole day mm -hmm. or however long your battery is supposed to last. There's a, a cost associated with sending those reports. And do you have a way to balance the trade-off there? Not, not one that's not obvious, I guess. Right? Like if you if you are on a coin cell battery where it's like you have one, it's one and done. You know, maybe it's even a fixed battery. Like you can't send a heartbeat every minute, like you said before. Um, sending a heartbeat every every hour or every few hours or even once a day is. Pretty good, actually. Um, you should be able to do pretty well. And and if you have persistent storage, what we tell a lot of people as well is like store up, you know, a week or two of heartbeats on flash um, in a compressed format and then send them up when you're ready. Um, slight, slight plug there from Mfault as well. Like we are able to store plenty of heartbeats and... And now, like, I think each each metric that you track is basically, like, six to eight bytes. And if you have, you know, a few K of flash, you can batch up quite a number of, quite a few heartbeats. Um, and, yeah, when you when you then have a connection or maybe even a user, you know, plugs your, plugs your device into a, a wall socket or charges it, then you can send up everything. Yeah. I've had some devices that it's it's once you are plugged in, okay, now just send everything you've ever wanted to send in the past. <laughs> well, it's, yeah. it's a balance between logging and statistics, too. If you can boil stuff down to statistics, that's to easier. To a few numbers, yeah. Yeah, that's easier to send periodically uh, than, okay, I have, you know, one megabyte of the day's event logs. I got to ship all that up there. Both can be useful, but there's there's a big trade-off there. Yes, for sure. And, and we have found, yeah. And I think there's, there's a mixture between the two, right? You have logging, you have metrics, and then I think everyone has kind of come out with their own flavor of it. It's like the, the compressed logging, we call it compact logging. Other people call it hash logging, but it's basically like take this human readable message, provide that an ID. Um, you can pass a couple arguments and everything is basically stored as like UN32s and then you send up those. And that's much 
more compact and compressed than sending ASCII text. It's like how Apple Soft Basic used to work. Oh, really? <laughs> and they wonder why I still know the ASCII table pretty darn well. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's logging and metrics. Uh, there's this, this the statistics that you were, were mentioning, which you were calling the heartbeat. For me, a heartbeat is just anything from the unit, which usually is this uh, little packet yeah. of statistics. Mm-hmm. And you you set those you set those because you have battery issues, but you also the length of time you don't check in is the length of time it takes for a user who has changed something on the website to get that on their watch. Mm. And so this is like if a, if a user clicks install on the app store and then they're trying to send that down to the watch. Yeah. If you're only checking in once an hour, doesn't that mean it takes an hour for it to, to check in? Oh, I mean, this is more for, for diagnostic data that the user, I mean, they opt in, of course, I think that's generally the trend now is you, you opt into all this diagnostic data and you have to, um, this is like the device is basically in control of sending that data. Yeah. Um, for at least at Pebble and Fitbit, it was like, you're on the phone, let me install an application, you're directly connected to the device, and then that just sends it over immediately. Sorry, I was back in cell phone, <laughs> where you, if you only said hello, actually this is in the underwater thing I've been working on, if you only say hello once an hour, and you're only awake that one time to listen then Any somebody has to wait an hour for you to get around to saying hello again. <laughs> yeah. It's like working on a Mars rover. Yeah. It's like Mars. Rover. I mean, you, you laugh at this. This is, this is a way for people to implement their own version of stage rollouts though. Right. If a device <laughs> only wakes up every hour or once every 24 hours and checks in, you know, here's my heartbeat. Do you have anything for me? And that's the kind of in the payload, right? Like you send all yeah. your information and then the the server responds like, okay, I got it. And also like, here are some things you should know about the world. Um, a lot of times that's going to be like, here's an OTA payload for you to install. And if you just like <laughs> release the firmware for 30 minutes and then turn it off, that's pretty much the stage rollout, right? <laughs> That's one way to do it, yes. <laughs> Although realistically, I would rather have my, you know, the engineers, the company, and then the company's friends and family who will report bugs directly to us and then go out to the to the bigger picture, to the larger audience, even though that means you may have a bias towards different cell phones. True. Very true. Or um, environments. Yes, or environments. I was going to say, like, um, that is always one suggestion as well. We say, like, do do your stage rollouts, but also have your internal developers or users, which, you know, at, it's usually the company employees. Like, if you're working for a hardware company, like, every employee should be required to test your device or use it or wear it. And, and ooh, another thing I always suggest is, like, if your device is experiencing an issue or asserting or has rebooted like when you're doing internal testing like make that very loud if you're making you know um a smart lamp like you know even the simplest thing like make the lamp flash on for like 30 seconds like on and off and that's like telling the user this thing probably crashed like please load up your phone and submit a bug report you know internally and at least at pebble like if the device crashed on an internal build We had like a a build flag that basically said, pop up this window if it reset, if this is an internal build, um, it would like pop up a screen that you couldn't do anything else. It was like, your your Pebble just reset, please submit a bug. And you had to dismiss it. Um, We didn't do that. And that was like, we didn't. No, I mean, I, I pushed for that very hard. Uh, we, we did, we did do it on, I mean, now we're getting into history. Ionic. I built it on Ionic, but it was only for internal and beta testers. Not sure I ever saw that happen. Huh. Okay. Yeah, I think it was a build flag, yeah, okay. um, but it was only, I think, if you opt, opted oh. in as well, and there was, ugh, I mean, yeah. Okay, so that's that's the firmware side. That's some trade-offs mm-hmm. on the firmware side and, and a little bit on the management side. But one of the things at ShotSpotter and Fitbit was, okay, now that I have thousands or hundreds of thousands of units, uh, these 
50 or 100 have had problems. How much time do I spend each day looking at those problems or trying to find the root cause or even finding out about those problems, which Ding, ding, ding. Finding about finding out about those problems is the hardest part, right? Um, it's it's it comes back to like millions of devices. Everyone's going to have a problem, right? <laughs> Everyone is. I mean, <laughs> everyone they're, they're, is going to have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, not necessarily everyone, but there will always be at that at that scale. There will be yes. thousands of bug reports every single day, right? Like no doubt about it, thousands. Um, and yeah, it's generally my battery life was bad and it was probably the user was out of range or something. Right. And the other issues will be, um, my device didn't connect to, to Wi-Fi or Bluetooth and it will probably be, they have a weird router or phone and it just doesn't work in, in those weeds. There are actually bugs and then trying to find those is the hardest part. And if you're, if you're starting out on firmware, and what I see people do time and time again is like they build a firmware and they sit, they they capture logs and they send logs somewhere. They usually end up on some in some S3 bucket or on some person's hard drive. And you know, when you're doing 20 devices, you can look through those logs generally every single day and like control F it or command F it, Grab, depending on which yeah. platform you're on. And you can build some like really simple Python scripts that can basically like yeah. parse through some logs. <laughs> but yeah, like to your point, when you're doing even a thousand devices or a million, like no one is going to find the real issues and especially the new issues that happen. Right. And when you get a new issue, like if you've seen this issue a bunch and you've kind of gotten the idea that it, it happens and the unit resets and I'm just, I can't find it in the code, but that's okay. But when you get the new issue and you've never seen it before and you're like, Oh, is the, is this the start of the tidal wave of problems? How do you how do you bubble those up? How do you decide what's um, a important thing to tell people? Yep. Um and and this is where memfault really comes into play, honestly, because uh yeah, quickly to cover this, what, what are those issues that are going to be very important, right? It's probably going to be your device is crashing or it's going to be sounding some alarms on like asserting or, or some sort of like really bad, like your device and it's heartbeat is saying like bug or issue or holding up a red flag, right? Memfault is built in a way that when a device crashes or has a particular log, you, it will basically capture a signature of it. Um, it. It captures a core dump or it captures a log. It sends that to our server. We we basically, yeah, generate a signature of it. And if it's a new signature, we will generate a new ticket. We'll send you an email. We'll send you a Slack message. And we will show it on the front page to be like, hey, you know, your firmware, ver- the firmware version you just updated um, and pushed out like has a new bug. Um, and if it's one we've seen before, we will increment a counter. And so it's not this like, you're not getting a thousand new bug reports that you have to basically like crawl through. You're just being alerted to the one or two new ones that you have maybe that day. Um, and to figure out which ones are actually important, it's probably the ones that are affecting the largest number of devices, I would say, or the CEO's device. Um, usually yep. those two. Yep. Yep. The CEO's device is always high important. Or the press reviewer. Or the press reviewer. Exactly. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Um, we've done that as well, right? Like you put them into a special cohort of devices um, or a special cohort and you do not update their firmware during, you know, during the release event. <laughs> um, or if you do, you like make sure it's a special build that like doesn't do anything fancy. It's like kind of a facade. <laughs> no matter what you do, whatever button you press, it goes to the next screen and looks perfect. <laughs> I mean, we've done it. Oh, yeah. It's just a sticker. <laughs> um, I remember at at Fitbit uh, finding a new issue in the company-wide rollout of a problem mm-hmm. and realizing I didn't know that person, um, but since this was important and the bug was whacked, 
I mean, just crazy. Couldn't figure out what it was doing. Um, actually called and, and, and said, okay, so, you know, at blah, blah, blah time. This was an internal person. This was an internal person. You never like, do this didn't call actual like, customers. Oh my gosh, okay. No, no, this, this was an internal person who knew they had... I went into the customer service database, found this person's registration. I just called them at home and said, hey, I noticed your watch isn't working. <laughs> and And they were very confused, naturally, and then looked at the time and then said, oh, that's when I put it in the dryer. <laughs> oh. So I decided I didn't have to chase that bug anymore. Uh, yeah. And actually that's the whole creepiness of that. Uh, especially as you go to customers, how do you handle those data ethics? I mean, internal customers and Fitbit was small at that time, but I had the keys to their, their debug beta database for a little longer than I should have. Um, how do you how do you balance the, I need this information versus, oh, this shows the customer was in such and such a place at this time and doing, so they must be, I don't know. This is, this is like when the, the watch uh, that w people were running with was showing how the military base was set up. Right, right. It's this Strava, yeah. There, there are different types of, of debug information that you can send from a device, right? There are hardware metrics, like what is the readouts from these sensors? Like, are the sensors reporting faulty information? Um, I know we tracked some metrics at, at Pebble where um, we would record the max and the min X, Y, and Z axes from the accelerometer. And basically what we would, what we would verify from that is like, if we just got bogus results for that hourly heartbeat, we knew that that accelerometer, like either one is completely faulty and that product should be replaced or two, like something really weird went, went wrong during that time. And like maybe something else, maybe there's a firmware bug. And so like, that's not revealing anything private about the user and anyway it's just it's just hardware data um gps locations are very different that's where the product is located um at least for, um, for us at menfault like we don't tell we tell people explicitly do not send us that type of information don't send us where people are located how quickly they're moving um and anything that is personally identifiable like what if they need that information for their own device management does that mean they have to split their their stream of information? Generally. And generally they do. Um, not many people use Memfault as their primary data pipe. They, they have some other auxiliary pipe that they basically pipe all of their product or PII or, or things that make their product completely function. Like they're not where Memfault is currently ingesting, you know, debug and monitoring information and some sort of configuration management for some devices. A lot of times they even send all of, all of our data to their own servers. And then they send over the memfault specific stuff. They basically pass it over from server to server to our service. And that's how they keep a lot of that stuff away from us. And yeah, at Pebble, like we, we captured in a Fitbit too, like we captured a lot of data, but I would say not much of it if if any of it at that time was like identifiable, it was just like how many times was a flash sector read or written to erased? How long did it take? How long was the heart rate task running? Like these things are critical to debug, but in no way like useful information to identify a person or, or understand what they were doing. I have some listener questions, uh, if you don't mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, Philip Johnston of Embedded Artistry, when I said you were on, I think he was ready to write the whole outline for me. He, he asked really good questions. Uh, so let's see. In most orgs I've worked in, they hesitate to outsource device management and prefer to build it in-house. Is that simply not invented here syndrome, or are there factors with existing services that drive companies toward that decision? Probably both. I think the most 
obvious reason why they want to build it in house is I think what we talked about earlier. It, there just doesn't seem to be a great solution out there. Um, at least for the, the factory line provisioning that they need to do. Um, generally companies are just going to, to build that in house because that's what they had to do five, 10 years ago anyways. And the same people are going to be working the lines and they know what to do in terms of, are there any, yeah. I mean, in the other existing thing is like, if you're trying to use a device management tool that you don't know if it's going to exist when your product, you know, is nearing its end of life or like is going to continue. Like you're trying to support a product for 10 years. I think in the consumer space, we, you know, I wish it was longer, but we want a product to maybe last like two, three, four five years. But if you're building a product for government or a city or a sensor that's supposed to stay in the same place for 20 or 30 years, like you probably should build that system yourself so that you can at some point in time, like lock it in a closet and never touch it again. And hopefully it just continues to work forever. Um, who knows if AWS is going to want to continue, I mean, probably not Google, um, but who knows if these companies are going to want to support their IOT platforms in five or 10 years. Yeah. I don't know if Google had, it has an IOT device management system oh, and do, I wouldn't, but I wouldn't, wouldn't trust consider it. <laughs> no, they burned me after their Google reader. I'm never trusting them again. <laughs> that was it. That was what... <laughs> Okay, Philip also asked, what are the real challenges with managing a fleet of devices versus what people think are the challenges, oh, but turn out to be easy? Ooh, all right, two-part question. The real challenges are are what we talked about before. It's, it's signal from the noise. I think m- most device management platforms today are, are truly built for 20 to a hundred devices. It is, they are built for, I think on, on these dashboards that you see from these products that you're basically looking at, you know, you're comparing your device manager platforms, the dashboard that they show is like a green or a red box for all of the devices in your entire fleet. Yes. And you're basically trying to look for like the one red box and you're like, Ooh, this device number 72 is offline. Like, let me go walk over and see what's up with it. Or like call the, the assembly line, you know, manager and, and ask them to go reboot it. When you're doing thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of devices, like you're always going to have like a thousand of them read if you're, you know, using this sort of device management tool. And so it's, it becomes, is, is this number worse on previous release or worse in the new release, you know, was there a regression or an improvement? And I don't believe Memfault, Memfault is, is getting much better. At this, I think we're the only company that I, that I've seen do it is like easily comparing release to release. So you just upgraded from 1.0 to 2.0. How do your metrics compare between them? How are your devices behaving? You know, how did the battery life change? Um, historically, like six months ago, how was the battery life between 1.0 and 2.0? Like all of these things, I just don't believe these device management tools do well, if at all. Um, and yeah, there's always going to be be noise, but there's, and there's always going to be a signal. It's just like trying to figure it out. I think, I mean, that, I think your statistics there and the noise definitely show your Fitbit and Pebble background. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's true on almost everything that you, you have to figure out which of these bugs is important to spend your day on and which of them you have no chance of fixing until something else happens. Mm -hmm. But the battery component is one of the wearables that is just makes it that much harder. What about the other part of Philip's question? Um, What do people think is difficult, but it turns out to be easy? People, companies like to think that their product is actually the hard part. You know, this, <laughs> this we're trying, I mean, I'm just, I'm just naming things randomly. It's like, let's go build a TV remote. You know what the hardest part is, is building that TV remote. That's what they think. <laughs> and, and it turns out just not to be the, the problem is actually like managing the firmware updates. It's managing customer support. And how do you get customer support to understand the low level firmware enough to know like what's a real bug and what's not a real bug and what's just go reset the device. Um, and yeah, I, 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 I do believe that 
writing the firmware and building your product is probably the easy part because you've probably hired or trained people to do that. You have not hired a bunch of people who know how to manage and yeah, manage very low level, very, you know, ancient like devices in a modern world. And, and, and one of the things that I think people, people struggle with as well is like, you don't know what you don't know. If you've never, and you probably have many stories about this as well, is like, if a firmware engineer from five years ago tried to build a product in the firmware world today, they'd pull their hair out for sure. They're like, you mean I have to like do what? I have to communicate to phones, routers, secure transport, um, firmware updates every single month to every single week, even nightly sometimes. And you have to like have a beautifully crafted like touchscreen display. All, <laughs> all of it. Um, it's just hard. Not many people... There, there, there's only been so much time where we've demanded these sorts of things from from these low level, low level devices, um, and so I think those are the hard parts because we've not done them before. Um, we only did them at Pebble because we were really naive. We were like, "Well, we think we need these things. Like we're we're generally software engineers. Um, let's learn how to write some firmware. And if we can't build or find the tools, or if we can't find the tools that we needed in the software world like building ios and android apps like we got to build them ourselves because that's what we know is required whereas i think if you build hardware for a living you don't know that these software tools are required so many of the tools that i've taken part in building up weren't designed like you're saying they were the effect of 3 a.m debug sessions the realization that, oh, we have to monitor battery life because if we don't, then we don't know that it's broken. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you get engineers to understand that going, I mean, it's really not something you worry about when it's on your desk or when it's in your lab, but when it, it turns into enough devices that people go to Reddit <laughs> I don't know why I'm picking on Reddit now. Um, Cause it's noisy. It's great. I mean, it's great. Very, very fanboys and girls. I, I only go to like the origami channel these days. <laughs> it's not a channel. Is it? What are the Reddits? Subreddits. Subreddits. <laughs> I think I know where your question is going. It's like, how do you then train or, or get engineers to understand that like they need to focus on these problems now, not when the customer support tickets come flooding in that like right. the battery life is now bad. Right. Cause then as soon as you hear about it that time, then it takes you like months to fix. Um, and no one, no one wants that two to three month debug session. Well, it's not even the two to three month debug session. It's the, not, we have to fix this oh. problem and figure it out, but also oops, we really should be tracking this since now we have to have a crash program to actually do the kind of logging and stuff that we weren't doing before, right? And the bug only took oh, like yeah. two days to fix, but now you have your release process so that it doesn't have another bug in it that causes yeah, more problems. Yeah, yeah. We're all forgetting the fact that you have to reproduce this issue first as well. You have right. to understand. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's, you know, probably the part that, oh man, I mean, the amount of people that I've, that or interns or, or sad, you know, sad individuals that I've, that I've talked to, they're just like, oh, I've been reproduce trying to reproduce a bug for like two weeks and it still hasn't cropped up. Um, oof. That's the thing with a oh. million devices. If yes. they all run for a day, you can get a truly, one, in, truly weird truly things happening. one yeah. in a million sort of, yeah, yeah. Bugs get I've, weird. I've talked, to, I've talked a lot about this. Uh, a, a, a plug for an interrupt article. It is one of my favorites. It is um, defense. I mean, it's such a it's such a clickbait article, but I love it. Defensive programming friend or foe. But <laughs> it's what I what I talk about in it is more of this concept of offensive programming. Um, it's yes, when you when you have a million devices, like every you're going to get one of every single crash that's in that firmware pretty much or like one of every single issue per day and the the goal of of that offensive programming is like trying to surface 
as many bugs as possible, as quickly, and as loudly as possible. And what that allows you to do is fix them early and and very quickly, and ideally very easily as well. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's the... If you get to that point, though, you need a lot of systems in place before that. You need data that the devices are sending you that allow you to track down exactly what bugs exist and how did my devices crash and how did my battery life drop? Like what are the the different metrics that, that pertain to battery life and kind of contribute to it? Um, oh, there's so many more, you know, ant tunnels to talk about in this topic as well. But yes, I mean, there's, there's so much <laughs> actually. So I've done, I've done the role where I've monitored the the devices. It's not one I'm particularly suited towards, but I've done it enough that, especially as products come up and go from a hundred inside a company to a couple, maybe ten thousand outside a, com- a company. After that, I'm just not the right person. Um, I wouldn't say any firmware engineer really is because it it becomes more of a data science problem. Is there is there a new role? Is there a new engineering title for? the person who monitors these and tries to prioritize what, what can happen. It's called the enthusiastic firmware engineer. Ah, the intern. (laughs) Um, Ah, the under 30 set. (laughs) I mean, yeah, I just hit, I just hit 30 this year. So (laughs) you you can turn off your enthusiasm now. (laughs) (laughs) No, I will never. Um, But seriously, that is, I mean, if we're going to be honest, that is the role that need that, that generally takes place, right? Like I, I very rarely hear about companies hiring a like higher level firmware engineer. I think that's the role that I took at Pebble. I like slowly morphed myself into like higher level firmware engineer slash Python, you know, Python and web app builder. Like I built a lot of web application tools at Pebble. Um, and at Fitbit, like I kind of carved my way into this role after like nine months that was developer productivity tools where, you know, we built a, a CLI to kind of build and manage the firmware locally. And I built some web applications to parse a bunch of the data that the device sent. I, you know, it parsed a bunch of core dumps, parsed logs. Got rid of my really bad Python script. Which one exactly, <laughs> the one that oh that tracks the core dumps. <laughs> um, and but that that role doesn't exist. It's usually the the embedded engineer who spends you know some extra nights or 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 weekends or has has done it before or yeah who has who has done it for a previous company, and thankfully now there is Memful like you you. In, integrate the SDK and you get most of this data, but you still need to be, you still need to understand like what metrics to capture and what, what does it mean to have this metric be different on this release and this release. And that just happens through socializing and talking to your community and asking, you know, the hard questions and, you know, you asking these questions on the podcast and hopefully people listening. Well, and you are right because Somebody who wasn't intimately familiar with the firmware couldn't look at these trends and understand where the root causes might be. They could write a bug that said battery life is down in all of in in some number of units, but it would take a firmware engineer to say, "Oh, those are all iPhones or those are all Android phones or those are all units we shipped in the first month or something. Well, and it, mm-hmm. it's not just that. It's it's uh, somebody who has knowledge enough of the, the product, uh, the product management or the project management. I always get those confused. But to see what, where you are in like a feature set, because maybe you turned on a new power uh, battery hogging feature and now everybody's using mm-hmm. their GPS to track something and they weren't before. Well, then that's why you're getting, you know, 30% less battery life every yeah. Uh, every day. So woohoo, heart rate works. Oh, now my battery dies. <laughs> oh, we, we, we ship that heart rate feature, but you probably shouldn't keep it on all the time. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> um, 
you also do tools. I think we're going to have to have him back to do the tools, tools conversation. Cause, cause it's I, a long I, conversation. It is a, it, well, because I had a lot of questions. I know, and we're already... Uh, All right. How, how much time is it? We're at an hour and 15 now. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Sorry. No, no it's great. You. This is very good. But I do want to talk about <laughs> tools, and it, we would not do it justice if we were to try to do it now. I'm happy to come back. Part two. There, there's, oh, there's so much more to talk about. There's so much. Yeah. And I mean, this this whole device management thing is going to become a bigger problem as we go on. Forever. It's always going to be a bigger it's, problem. It's going to be bigger <laughs> and bigger. And I'm still going to call them distributed systems, darn it. <laughs> it's it's a good term. I just haven't you know heard that before when talking about embedded devices. Like I mean, you it's are not like they're, it's the not like they're working bold. together. It's not like all the Fitbits are working together. They're all individual systems. That was never what distributed systems meant. It doesn't? It doesn't imply a mesh of any kind. It doesn't? Uh, Tyler, <laughs> I heard Memfault is hiring. Would you like to give us more information? Yes. Currently, we are hiring for a firmware solutions engineer. And that is, you know, building up our SDK, talking to customers, and generally being an evangelist for the company, and also a data engineer. All these devices send us a bunch of data. We have to analyze it, store it, and and produce insights and tell people how their devices are failing or succeeding in the field. And yeah, we're looking for a data engineer. And Tyler, do you have any thoughts you'd like to leave us with? It's more of a, yes, it's more of a like, this is what I've learned over the last, you know, two years in COVID, but kimchi is very easy to make. And I suggest everyone try to make some kimchi at home if they like it. Unexpected, but excellent. Our guest has been Tyler Huffman, co-founder of Memfault. If you'd like to check out their blog, well, it'll be in the show notes. But if you can't find that, type interrupt and Memfault together and you will definitely find it. Thanks, Tyler. Yeah, thank you both. Have a great one. Thank you to Christopher for producing and co-hosting. Thank you to our Patreon listener Slack group for questions, in particular, Philip Johnston, which reminds me, if you've been considering supporting us in Patreon and you want to join that Slack, now is a really good time as the book club just started some really cool new stuff. Finally, thank you for listening. You can always contact us at show at embedded.fm or hit the contact link on Embedded FM. And now a quote to leave you with. This one's from Jack Kerouac. My fault, my failure, is not in the passions I have, but in my lack of control of them.